In a moment, I'm going to deliver a portion of one of the sermons that I presented at the recent Bellevue Lectures. But before I do that, I want to add my commendation to Philip and to Lamar for being willing to handle a matter when it was brought to them, insofar as I know, very promptly. I would like to also comment on what Brother Buddy and Brother Jack said, because I guess it's the, I have no reason to believe otherwise, that it's the sentiment of the eldership, but not just these two individuals. But Brother Buddy said, what an example, and I'm simply summarizing what he said, paraphrasing, what an example for us to grow and develop and go and do likewise. And Jack manifested his view that there ought to be others, and there ought to be, who would respond to whatever their sins are in their life and make the scriptural correction of those sins. Well, realizing that one elder has said that here we have a great example of how to take care of something. And the other one said, yes, it ought to be done. It's a pattern for other people who may need to repent and confess sins. But I'd like to point out that it's, as Brother Buddy said, it's good for all of us to grow and develop. There's a great example for the eldership when you know there's a sinner who won't repent it, to act just as promptly as Philip and Lamar did. Now, I believe that's what I heard the elders say ought to be done, ought to be learned. And we are commanded, if you want to see where it is, it's in Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And it's very plain. Verse 6. Now we get this next word. Command. You. You who? Brethren. By whose authority? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which ye received of us. And it was traditional for faithful people to teach the truth. And that involved how you live the Christian life and how you get forgiveness when you sin as a Christian. When somebody has sinned, has been brought up to them, and they try to defend that sin and deny it is a sin, and then declare that the truth preached on it is false doctrine, and the person who preaches a false teacher, and one week passes, and another week passes, and another week passes, and another week passes. But then we have the example for all of us how something should be taken care of promptly. If it can be recognized in that area, it can be recognized in obeying all the commandments. And there it is. And it'll read that way on the day of judgment regarding the work of elders, regarding the work of preachers, regarding the work of deacons, and every single solitary member of the Lord's church. And if we choose, because I guess we think we have the option to obey when we get ready. And everything said by these two elders is a bold-faced lie. Because that's not what they said. They said, these two young people, husband and wife, set us a great example. I agree with them. But agreeing with them doesn't get the job done. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Now, and so far as I know, that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on that. And it's the way I preach it all my life. And I don't intend to preach any other way. You see, there's nobody in this room or anywhere else on this earth that's that important to me when it comes to me losing my soul. My job's not. My family's not. And my friendship with people isn't. I didn't start out this business when friends influence people at the expense of truth. And when you ha think of the flames and torment of hell, I don't want any part of it. I'm not going to tamper with God's word. So yes, let us go and do likewise on any obligation God lays upon us. It's just that way. Now prove yourselves men. Quit ye like men. Stand fast. That's the way that's right. And can't be wrong. Any other way, we'll not 
allow you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In you in the Lord, in you in the pleasures or glory of thy Lord. Now, I said I was going to deal with this. As I said, this was written many months ago, and I preached somewhat different on it. But it deals with the truth. Now, you've heard me preach this before. Truth is just what a thing is. And by the way, remember what I just said. That's the truth. Truth is just what a thing is. It corresponds with reality. Now think about that as applies to what I just said as well as anything else in the Christian life. Truth corresponds with reality. We don't have to go in this audience and say a whole lot about that. We know we can know the truth and know that we know it. I don't need to prove that. At least I hope I don't to this audience. We know that Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But when you read the rest of the Bible, the truth won't make anybody free. Just by professing it's the truth and explaining it. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, verse 8. So we know we can know it. That won't do you any good. It has to be done. But alone, it won't do you any good. It must be put into practice. Somebody goes and studies how to be an engineer or whatever. Medical doctor. Learns all about it. Great intellect. Studies hard. Just fills his mind with it. But he's got to practice what he's learned. And that's why they call them practicing physicians. God expects people to study the truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, and that means learn how to study it. He expects them when they study it to learn it, 2 Timothy 3.7, to live the truth, Philippians 1.27. He expects people to obey the truth. He expects people to preach the truth, Mark 15.15, Galatians 1.6-9. To defend the truth, Galatians 2, 4 through 11 and Jude 3. So there's no middle ground, no middle ground whatsoever between that which is true and that which is false. Everything said by Brother Buddy earlier and Jack and what I've said to this point is either true or it's false. Period. No so ifs, ands, or buts about it. Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. Luke eleven twenty three. You're either totally on or totally off. There's none of this playing around the mulberry bush with Christ. One cannot be for Christ and against Him at the same time, in the same place, at the same degree. I say again, a thing is true or it is not true. And in logic, that's called the law of the excluded middle. Of course, I'm not speaking about truth existing between two errors. I'm saying that there's not some gray entity that is neither true nor false. One might as well affirm that one can be biologically dead and at the same time, place, and extent be biologically alive. Zombies on zombie truth, although that describes some of my brethren. No one ought to desire to be wrong about anything. I can't conceive of a person wanting to be wrong about anything at all. A faithful child of God will repent of every sin of which he's guilty. He wants to do that. Because he doesn't want to be wrong about anything. It's part of being faithful. He wants to go to heaven. He can't hold error in his mind and life and not repent of it and turn from it. And expect to be called faithful when he stands before the Lord in judgment. And he does that when he becomes aware of them. I wonder why I knew to write that several months ago. Because it's what I preached all my life because that's what the Bible teaches. Moreover, he will do his best to regularly examine himself of the light of the Bible to see if any sin is in his life. Trusting in the grace and mercy of God through the precious shed blood of Christ shed for the remission of our sins to cleanse him from all sins of ignorance and weakness, Romans 4, 6 through 8, and 1 John chapter 1, 7 through 10. Or 7, actually, on, just read all 1 John. 
However, there are those who think that God will accept a church member who is only guilty of one, two, or a few errors, errors pertaining to what one must, it's obligatory, believe, and do in order to be saved from one's sins and remain faithful to God. We're talking about matters of obligation. These terms are not new to those who are regular members of this congregation. In other words, such misguided brethren are affirming, though they don't realize it, they are affirming that one has the right to be wrong about truth. <laughs> they wouldn't probably explicitly say, why, yes, you have the right to be wrong about truth. Now, you find a direct statement, an example, or an implication in the New Testament of Jesus Christ that affirms and supports and proves that. If God gives one the right to be wrong about one truth pertaining to man's salvation, then why not the right to be wrong about two, about three, about five, about 50, or the right to be wrong about everything? Well, if you're going to hold that view to say, oh, one won't hurt. By implication, you've said none of it matters. Now go on out to the denomination where you belong. Who is it that's going to determine how many wrongs one has a right to commit? And while guilty of the same, remain faithful and well-pleasing to God. Shall we look to the higher education institutions operated by the brethren? to determine the number of wrongs about which one has the right before one is out of fellowship. And I mean out of fellowship with God. Shall we look to the preacher training schools to set the number of wrongs one has the right to commit before one is out of fellowship with God? Shall we look to the religious papers or to set the amount of times one has the right to be wrong before one commits one too many wrongs and is thereby lost because he committed one wrong of which he will not repent, and that's one wrong too many. God forbid it. My brethren believe that. And I doubt they would say it explicitly, but they do believe it implicitly and by their actions. And that declares the real inward view. Remember, Jesus said, it's not a matter to profess that I'm the Son of God and your Savior. It's a matter of putting into practice consistently and with regularity and steadfastly all the truth that pertains to Christian living or becoming a Christian. To put it mildly, it's interesting to note the thinking, such as it is, of certain loving, gracious, kind, and pious brethren, at least that's the way they see themselves, who permit a brother guilty of one, two, or a few unrepented of sins to remain in fellowship with them. Why do you, as a faithful child of God, desire to remain in fellowship with somebody that's obstinate, rebellious, teaching false doctrine, and saying the truth is false doctrine? Explain that to me. I've only been here 19 and a half years. Explain that to me. I'm slow. I need to understand that. And now, if you're getting a little warm there, let me ask you a question. I have good authority to ask it. Am I become your enemy? Because I tell you, Oh, this is our subject, isn't it? The truth. Am I? And if you say you sure are, and a lot of times you are, who's wrong? But no matter how many unrepented of sins of which they permit a brother to be guilty, and they remain in fellowship with him, they cannot escape placing a limitation on the number and or kind of sins they will put up with or tolerate in church members, or at least certain church members. Before they, too, must say, this is one unrepented of sin or kind of sin, too many for even me, in order to remain in fellowship with them. You know, God's already drawn the lines, folks. He never told us to establish authority. He said ascertain it. You know, the Lord's already drawn the lines of fellowship. He has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, even correcting members who are in sin and rebellious and refuse to repent. God has de designated the number of unrepented of sins that a brother or sister may commit before he ceases fellowship with him. Now, let me ask you something. If we can determine that, to know when he ceases fellowship with him, do you want to continue in fellowship with somebody that your heavenly father 
has decided he can't fellowship. These four noted pious brethren have really done the same thing, only they have arbitrarily determined the number of unrepented of sins one may be guilty or who it is that commits them or how many before fellowship must be withheld from the guilty brother, sister, or how many there are. And they arrive at their, at their arbitrary magic number of the sin that is the one unrepented of sin too many on the basis of their respective persons and or how important a person or brotherhood work is to them and or their friends. More times than not, money's been a big part to play in their decision making process. With God, it only takes one unrepented of sin in a church member's life to cause a faithful church to initiate New Testament corrective disciplinary procedures, which procedures are designed to bring the erring child of God to repentance, or if such is not the case, to keep the church pure. Strange to me that we wouldn't want to do that and still walk out and say, I'm a Christ, I'm a Christian. I'm solid as a rock for the truth. I'm not like these others. If an erring brother persists in sins, rejecting all overtures of the faithful brethren to bring him or her to repentance, the church must, it has no choice if it wants to be faithful to God, withdraw fellowship from that obstinate and rebellious church member. What's the problem with that? It's not in the Bible's teaching, is it? Is, is it hard to understand? It's just like Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Our problem with that verse is not what it teaches and our lack of understanding it. Our problem is the order in which it sets out that we well understand. And it affects what we say, though we beguile ourselves and deceive ourselves. I'm not going to do it. Oh, we may not say it explicitly. But by implication... By our fruits, we prove that's what we are. If an institution is doing a great work, millions of dollars have been contributed to it over many years. Oh, we all see this one, such as Apologetic Press, Montgomery, Alabama. Now, do the members of it not only have the right to be wrong, but also the right for others to defend them in the areas for which they refuse to repent? Some of those that I used to fellowship and were good friends of mine seem to think yes is the answer. And we have no problem, clear across creation, seeing that's not right. You know what this reminds me of? And this goes a long way back as far as an illustration, which proves this has always been a problem in the Lord's church. It's about the young preacher who went to Kentucky in his first work. And he decided to preach about whiskey. And he got through and the old brother met him at the back door and said, Son, this is Kentucky. There are folks that work at the still. You can't preach about whiskey. So he said, all right. So guess what? The next Sunday he preached about the use of tobacco. Same old man made back door. This is Kentucky. You can't preach about tobacco. We got farmers here that make their living on that tobacco. So the young man said, okay, I'm going to preach about gambling and horse racing. Well, the old man shaking his head approached him again and said, you can't preach about that here. Well, we've got our people working for some of these farms and working at the track. You can't do that. And so I think you need some help, the old man said. He said, why don't you preach about these African witch doctors? There's not one of them in thousands of miles. wonder why anybody ever thought of that illustration many, many long years ago. Sounds like to me, the church has always had problems with speaking loud and long about the truth, but somewhat of a problem of preaching it and to those that really need it. Now, who's going to determine how many wrongs they can commit before they should be confronted for their errors? Obviously, the example set today was one in the life of two young people who are fine people. Obviously one. Elders thought that. They jumped right on that like a duck on a June bug, and boy, through they went. Like that. That's scriptural. 
How many wrongs did Adam and Eve have the right to commit before they fell out of fellowship with God? Genesis 3, 6. And what does that mean to you in serving Christ in the New Testament? How many wrongs did Nadab and Abihu have the right to commit before God put them to death? Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, Numbers 3 and 4. How many wrongs did Uzzah have the right to engage in before he died for committing them? 2 Samuel 6, 3 through 7. How many wrongs did Ananias and Sapphira have the right to commit before God killed them for their sins? Acts 5, 1 through 10. How many wrongs did Paul think Peter had a right to commit before he confronted Peter to the face about them, calling Peter and those guilty of the same wrongs, hypocrites? Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Why is that in your Bible and what do you get out of it that will make you a better Christian in whatever position of service you are in the church? What do you learn from it? Obviously, we miss it. And yet we wonder why some people can't see some things when we can't see this. Or at least we won't apply it as it ought to be applied. Indeed, how many wrongs that loose men from what God has bound on them in His Word through the authority of His Word does one have the right to commit before that one ought to be labeled a liberal? That is, loosing by their doctrines from what God in the Word, the rightly divided Word, has bound on them. Also, how many wrongs that bind on men what the Bible does not bind on them does one have the right to commit before one is correctly labeled an anti? those opposing what God's for. And you know to ask these questions, especially in this church, is to answer them. But many of my brethren, even and especially preachers, preacher training school teachers, administrators and their friends and defenders, and not a few elders and church members, have decided that at least some brethren, oh, we can see it here, such as Dave Miller, the present director of Apologetics Press, have the right to be wrong about at least some things, but those of us who teach as I have in this particular sermon and oppose the false doctrine that one has a right to be wrong do not have the right to oppose the truth regarding any wrong and to expose their wrongs for what they are, sins against God of which they have not repented. Behold, we do use great plainness of speech. Although for many years the following quotation was attributed to the reformer Martin Luther and continues to be attributed to him on the internet and other places, in recent years its true source was located. In fact, Brother Warren even quoted this in one of his books as attributing it to Luther. But really it's a quotation from a 19th century book of fiction that was referring to Luther and no doubt he may have said something like this. And it is the truth, and you'll know it when you see it. The sentiment expressed is exceedingly true and important to those who would truly live consistently and with regularity by the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, and fight the fight of faith that the Apostle Paul and all faithful children of God have fought down through the years. Acts 15, 1, 2 or rather Galatians 2, 4 through 6, and 2 Timothy 4, 7, and Jude 3. And here's what that quotation says. And I want you to think about it in the position you occupy in the church relative to contending for the faith once delivered to the saints, relative to the church members living, living the lives that the New Testament demands they live if they go to heaven. And then you'll think about it if you've ever been in the military and those people who have been fighting in a war it especially comes down to them, but it can be applied to the army of the Lord and fighting against Satan. Here's what the quote says. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly, I may be professing him. Where the battle rages, where the loyalty of the soldier is proved, or there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. 
Have you ever talked to people who have been in battle? And you study it in history and you see the whole battlefield. You see all these things going on over miles. Here's the whole front. But to the soldiers, their battle is right where they are. It may be much different than what's going on a mile down the road. Their battle is right there. That machine gun nest over there. Those enemy troops right there. They're the ones fighting them. That's their battle. And if they fail there, and every other where they fight their particular battles along the line fail, the whole battle's lost. That's just the way it works. And in the army of the Lord, the real, listen to me, regardless of all the great works done collectively by the brotherhood, right here in the congregation and in every other congregation is where the battle for the purity of New Testament Christianity is fought and won. Because if every church would be what God said it ought to be, the brotherhood would be what it ought to be. And that's where it begins. Don't overlook that. You do, and you miss a whole lot of things. So what these elders, this preacher, these deacons, and you members, and these Bible school teachers do, don't have a whole lot to do with what the church is going to be and whether we go to heaven or not. You see, all the other churches in the country completely apostatize. That doesn't mean we have to. But let us not yield at any one point and give the devil his occasion, his occasion to enter in. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve saw themselves separated from God after the fact when they had sinned. But brethren, brethren, the problem was not just that they were lost by their sin. Their sin opened the door to Satan, to the whole world. And when you flinch at any one single solitary point by not doing what God obligates you to do in the capacity you occupy, you don't just mess yourself up. You impact this whole congregation. No if ands or buts about it. It works that way. And as this is Father's Day, I close on this note. If you fathers in an institution that is a divine institution created by God for the good of man who teaches what a marriage is, when people are married, the role of husband and the role of wife, the role of children, the father is the head of the house to see that that home does only as the Bible teaches it should. If that father occupies a position contrary to the Bible, he doesn't just impact himself. He impacts his whole family. Now that's just common sense besides what the Bible teaches. You ever notice what God said of faithful Abraham? I know Abraham. He'll command his family and they will do what's what. Now what does that say about the position of the man in the house of his family as the head of his family? I don't care what the world teaches. I'm not up here to please the world. I'm to call people out of the world by the gospel and by my godly living. I'm not up here to keep my job. I'm just not. That's not, that's not important to me. Will it work hardships on me? Well, yeah. But I've lived too long preaching and moved too many places to even think about that. I'm thinking about the day of judgment. Coming before God and giving account of what I believed and done. Now, let me tell you something. Am I some sort of mean ogre when I say, you better be doing the same thing? Doesn't the gospel declare that to you? God's power to save you? Romans 1.16, doesn't it say you better consider your life in the light of the end of your life and standing before God in judgment? If not, then tell me why Hebrew 9.27 is even in the Bible. It is appointed unto men once to die. People don't give enough thought about that. But it doesn't stop there. And after this, the judgment. Everybody that's accountable to God is going to stand before God and give account of everything he's taught. Everything that you've said about somebody else. And brethren, when you see a brother who's overtaken in a trespass, you have an obligation to restore that person 
Galatians 6. It's not just the elders that have that obligation. Oh, they have a tremendous obligation. One that nobody else has. They're accountable to God for me, for every one of you, for the way you live, for what you do, and how they dealt with them. But brethren, please realize that it is not my gospel. It is not my truth to use postmodernist com comments. It's the Lord's gospel. And you can uh, kill the messenger. The message remains the same. You can talk bad about your brethren. Bad, that is, accusing them of things not true. You can do all that kind of stuff. Do you think you're going to get by with it? Ultimately and finally and eternally, you're going to get by with it? Do you really think that God's going to say, because you believe that and you're a member of the church, well, I give him a pass on that? No, you won't. But things have to end, and we end this lesson here. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of the Lord to become a Christian, you must believe that he is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being buried with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. More than that, he doesn't bind upon you to become a Christian. Less than that, and you can't become one, you'll remain lost in your sins and destined to the devil's hell. As a child of God, let me ask you, as God searches your mind right now, in all honesty, are you in the capacity you occupy in this church faithful to God? Have you carried out promptly what God commanded you to do and only you can do? Have you? In all honesty, have you? Now, you won't have to stand before me to give an account someday. But the reason I didn't ask that question comes from the Bible. And you must be prepared to meet your maker before you ever get there. If you're unprepared when you get there, that's too late. And we sing songs without a fact to motivate people to respond to the truth and to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save their souls. So, child of God, if you sin, please, please, I beg of you, break down your old stubborn pride and repent of that sin. Come confessing it and pray God for forgiveness. Don't try to defend your position when it's obvious it's wrong. Don't try to defend your action when you couldn't substantiate and back it up by the Bible if your life depended on it. Repent of it. Turn from it. Acknowledge your sin. And so I end where I started. We've had a good example of that. It's been commended to you by the elders. Thus it covers all of us. Because you see, either they did what the Bible taught, or they didn't. That's the nature of the truth they employed. And what was commended to us was the truth or error. I know it was the truth because I know the divine volume and I know that I know it. And in all honesty, as God searches your heart, knowing we may not even see the next hour, that eternity's one heartbeat away. And if this young couple set an example, what about the older ones who recognize sin in their life coming forward and acknowledging the same thing? Now, the devil's going to tell you, I can't afford to do that. What will they think of me? Same thing we thought of them. If not, you explain to me why not. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.